Hey guys, welcome back to EMT Made Easy. My name is John Mendoza and I am your host for today. I'm just playing. Um, I am going to be covering legal and ethical stuff. Not the entire chapter like always, but I am going to cover some stuff. First off, what is scope of practice? Scope of practice is what you can legally do with your EMT certification. Now, that can be even restricted more um, in certain states and counties or can be expanded in other states and counties. For example, in some, like California, uh, EMTs are very restricted. You can't do an IV, you can't insert advanced airway adjuncts in most counties, you can't at least. And also, that's pretty much what you can't do that you want to do. Um, but, however, in other states like some counties in Tennessee, uh, EMT can do an IV as long as they go to like an additional school, but you can actually do IVs out in the field. So that's what I mean by, that's what I mean by scope of practice and really it's defined based on your counties. But when it comes down to like definition wise, it's just what you can do legally as an EMT where you work. All right. Uh, so after that, let's go into consent. So no means no people. All right. Let's get that out of the way right now. I'm just playing. <laughs> I'll play too much. Um, consent, we have expressed, we have implied, and we have involuntary consent, which really isn't, con isn't consent, it just, it's involuntary, but that's what it's called. It's called involuntary consent. So let's go over express consent first. So who can give express consent? Consent. Uh, mentally competent individuals. They have to be at all times good. So the reason I'm saying anal times good is because some courses teach it as anal times three, some say anal times four. So as long as they're anal times good and they're a competent adult, they are good to go. Now, as far as mentally competent and being an adult, legal adult, um, it's not just people that are over 18 years old. So if your patient is emancipated, which means that they're under 18, but their parents signed a legal document saying that they can speak for themselves, do their own thing, um, then they can give you express consent. If the patient is pregnant, in, in some places, if they're pregnant or already have a kid of their own, they're considered legally to be an adult because they are already talking to force somebody else for their child, or they're about to for their child. So legally, they can talk to themselves. So these people can give express consent. So what is express consent? Express consent is a patient telling you or suggesting to you that you can actually give them care. So that would be if you were the EMT, you tell me, hey, John, can I take your blood pressure? Can I give you nitroglycerin? And we say, hey, yeah, EMT, go ahead. Give me uh, my nitroglycerin or take my blood pressure. So that's express consent, verbal express consent. Suggestive express consent means that uh, when you go up to the patient and say, hey, can I take your blood pressure? And the patient puts their arm out like that for you to take their blood pressure. I'm suggesting that you can take my blood pressure because I just don't want to talk to you maybe. I don't know. But that's suggestive or, expre or verbally expressed. Those two are considered express consent. Um, you're going to see informed consent a lot, kind of correlated with express consent. Uh, what informed consent means is that your patient knows of all the risks that are associated with the treatment you're rendering. So that means you told your patient, this might happen or this could happen if I do treat you or if I don't treat you, okay? EMTs don't really have to worry about this because they don't deal with real, um, what can I, how can I say this? They don't really deal with complex situations, right? They don't give complex treatment. It's pretty basic. It's basic life support. But nevertheless, you will see this hand in hand with express consent. Informed consent just means that the patient knows what's up before you treat them. So now let's move on to implied consent. Implied consent means that your patient would want you to treat them if they were logical. So any logical adult or human being would want me to treat them during this situation. But for some reason you can't get express consent. So this would be for a patient that's unconscious 
you roll up to a scene, patient's unconscious, there's nobody else around or nobody knows this person. I'm thinking that if this person is a logical person, I'm pointing out the ground because the patient, imaginary patient on the ground right now. If this person is a logical patient, um, they would want me to render care. So it's implied, you know, it's just implied, like I'm pretty sure they would want me to take, to take care of them if they were conscious. Also, children fall under this category of implied consent because they can't really speak for themselves if they're a minor, but you are going to assume that their parents would want you to treat them if the parents was there. So implied consent, patients are conscious, they're a kid, or that you can't communicate with the patient for whatever reason, whether it's a foreign language situation, um, they can't speak because they're mute, or there's just something in the way of communication. You're going to fall back to implied consent, all right? I'm assuming that, that this patient would want me to take care of them um, under this, this um, situation. Now, something that you may see with children, and it falls kind of under implied consent, but it's the term in locus parentis. And locus parentis means that in the place of a parent. That's what it means, it's a Latin, Latin phrase. In locus parentis, this falls when the kid is in a school setting, a daycare setting, where somebody of authority, a teacher, a nurse, a daycare a staff member, can speak on the parent's behalf, as long as the parents know sign said it's okay for them to actually talk on their behalf for you to take care of the kid. That's what that means. So in place of parents, you will see this in locus parentis. It's one of those phrases that you're gonna see in the book and you might just kind of go over, but it's gonna come back to attack you during the NREMT maybe. It might actually be in there, and I know that I have seen it in a few quizzes for EMT um, stuff. So, that's what's up with that. Now, involuntary consent, which is not up here, but I'll write it right now. Involuntary consent means that you're treating the patient um, even though they don't want that treatment. So, let me erase this real quick. Alright, so involuntary consent. If you watched my videos before, I'm sure by now you know I am a horrible speller, so should I spell wrong, not a big deal. Involuntary consent. Um, this would happen usually if you have a patient that's under arrest but needs to be treated and they just, they're being combative, they don't want treatment, but they need treatment and they are also under arrest. So these patients will, this can fall under involuntary consent. If your patient has some kind of psychological or mental health issue to where they, they are a, tre a threat to themselves or others, a professional that's certified to do this can actually put them on involuntary hold and that's involuntary consent to where they have to be transported because they're a danger to themselves or others. We call that a 5150, so it's good to know, know that right now, they're, they're a harm to themselves or others. So I'll write that down for you guys, so if they're 5150, 5150 um, under arrest. These individuals will get this. Uh, besides that, oh yeah, so what should I hit up? Can you put a patient in involuntary consent? Can you say, hey, I don't care what you're saying, I'm gonna just treat you anyways. No, you can't. Only two types of people can do this, a cop, can actually put somebody in involuntary consent so they can force them to go with them because right now they're under arrest because the cop can arrest a person or a physician or some kind of uh, medical professional that's certified to put somebody on a hold because they're a danger to themselves or others. So you can't, okay? Very important. Let's see what else I got to cover here with you guys. Involuntary consent. All right, so. Uh, as far as patient refusal, you guys will see patient refusals a lot. I know I've seen them quite a bit. People just don't want to be cared for because this could be for many different reasons. It could be because they're scared of the bill. They don't trust going, they don't trust the hospital. They read a book and they found out that maybe going to the hospital ups their chances of dying. I don't know. It's a conspiracy. Who knows? But people sometimes don't want to be treated. 
or maybe they, they think it's not a big deal, right? So that what you do for people that, so for refusals, right? Refusal. First, step one, try to convince them. Convince them to go. Talk to them, say, hey, I know you don't wanna go, but that looks pretty serious. And if you don't get treated, it can turn into an even more serious situation um, and it might be too late. I'm just saying it's not for sure. Something along those lines, all right? Um, second, if they still don't wanna go with you, try to get a doctor on the phone, get med control. When people usually, usually talk to a doctor, they respect doctors and they'll go, okay? Now, if they don't wanna go, third step, I wrote these down for you guys. You want to have them sign the AMA. This is very important. I will pause this video right now and write this down. AMA. This means against medical advice. That means that you did this, you did this, and the patient still does not want to go. All right? That's what this means. It's going to cover your butt. That means you tried to convince the patient, you told them what could happen, they're informed of the situation, but they still don't want to go. They don't want to go. Um, you have to sign this, uh, a witness should sign, should sign it too, your partner, the cop, whoever's there, and then the patient can sign it as well. If they refuse to sign it, just document it, uh, and then go about your business. Finally, the fourth thing you want to do for these people that are refusing to go and get patient care is that you want to tell them, call us. Um, what I mean by that is that you want to tell them, hey, if you think that it's, it's getting worse, if this occurs again, if you feel that now you need patient care, please call us, let us know. By you doing these four things, you're covering your butt, you're actually making sure that the patient knows the seriousness of the situation, and it's just a legal thing also. So do these, things, these four things for patients that are refusing, and you'll be okay in life, and you'll be okay in your NREMT exam. So let me erase this, and we have a few more things to cover before I go. It's kind of cold in here, and my heater's still not working. I should get a heater for this place. All right, so as far as refusals go, don't just give up on the patient. If you go, if you go in the car and the patient's like, hey, I don't want to go, then you be like, all right, cool, I don't care. If you don't care, I don't care. Don't do that. There's nothing worse than you leaving the call without even trying and then finding out that the patient died later on. That's not good. By you doing that, you can be, it can be liable. So that's called liability to where you knew something serious could potentially happen or you didn't, you didn't even care to investigate and the patient now dies and that's really your butt because if you didn't even try um, and the patient dies down the road and it comes back to you, you really can't excuse that and you will get in trouble. That's liability. So write, write that down. Liable. Liability. Um, you just, it's neglect. You neglected to treat the patient. You, you didn't go, you, you just did below the minimum of what's required for your job. So don't do that at all. All right, so with that being said, let's say that you were, you were trying to convince the patient, like, hey, let's, let's go to the hospital. I think you have to go to the hospital. And the patient starts to get confrontational with you. They, they just, don't, they're not having it. They're like, hey, let me go. I don't wanna to talk to you. I don't wanna sign that AMA. I don't want anything to do with any of you. The best thing to do is not to get confrontational with them. So don't start threatening them. Don't be like, hey, if you don't go with me, I'm gonna put you in that, in that gurney and I'm gonna tie you up and I'm maybe gonna hurt you. Like, don't, don't do any of that, right? Don't, don't, don't push it because that right there is not good for you. It's called assault. That's called assault. So that means that you put them in a position to where they now think that they're going to be hurt. Like, oh man, this EMT is going to harm me or kill me if I don't go with them. That's called assault. I pause it right now and I write that down. Assault. That's when you threaten somebody pretty much or you have just 
put them in a position to where now they're thinking that you're going to hurt them really bad, all right? Now, if you actually go the extra step into the dog side and actually put your hands in them, strain them without a cop there, the authority figure telling you to do it or saying, yes, go ahead and do it, or without a physician, no. If you just restrain it on yourself because you just want to, they push your buttons, now you shift it from assault to battery. And that's not good. That can get you arrested for sure. So I pause it right now, battery. That's you actually putting your hands on a patient and now you went from assault threatening to battery of a patient. And you, that's not good. You will get in trouble for that. And I think that's all I'm gonna cover today, guys. This is code. I might make another video uh, for AEIOU tips today at my casa. And if it's if you're watching this and it's around 2017, around April-ish, April, there might be a link below to take you to a different website because I'm gonna make a whole bunch of these videos to where it's gonna break everything down, a much better setting, they're actually gonna be edited. Uh, these YouTube videos are, that I'm putting up here are just kind of just, just kind of going with it, you know, just to help you folks out. And yeah, I'll catch you on the flip side later.